Hi, this is Captain Al Lawrence Eddie for SkimmerOutdoors.com. Uh, here doing a little something different. Um, it's 25 degrees outside, the wind is blowing like crazy, nobody's fishing up in the northeast. And uh, I had mentioned last year that I was going to do a little critique of that crazy, amazing show that's one of the hottest shows on Cablevision called Wicked Tuna. Um, so we had a little time here, Tim and I were going to kind of kind of explore it a little bit and talk about that show. Uh, I like the show, I, I think it's excellent, but I do have some criticisms, uh, you know, about some of the composition, the editing, and a couple of things that I had seen. And I guess the reason for that is uh, I have giant tuna fish back in the 70s for a number of years. I was up in Gloucester doing the exact same thing these guys are doing. And so when you have done that before and you're a, a fisherman, not just a casual viewer of the non-fishing public, you see certain things that just don't jive right, you know. Uh, I guess it's a reality show, let's face it. It's a fishing show, but it's a reality show. And so I don't think they went out there to make a totally uh, perfect, in all respects, video in regard to the fishing. Uh, they're taking care of two audiences people who are interested in fishing and then general public who are interested in drama. Uh, as I said, back when I was fishing in the early 70s up in Gloucester, uh, it was strictly a sporting event. There was very little money involved. The typical fish then, uh, back at the uh, dock, you probably got anywhere between 15 and 30 cents a pound for the fish. So, you know, an 800 pound fish might be 150, 200 dollars which was just about enough to cover your bait and fuel. And that's basically what the people who were fishing up there did. They would catch a fish when they were lucky enough to get one, sell it off just to cover their expenses. There was no, nobody making money at that fishery. Around the mid 70s to the later 70s, what happened was uh, at that point, Japan's economy was really booming. A lot of uh, their electronics were being shipped over here in cargo planes and there was nothing to return. Those planes returned back to Japan with nothing in them. So someone had the bright idea since Japanese people uh, you know, love to fish and they love to consume fish uh, that they would take these tuna fish which they were buying on the cheap three or four hundred dollars a fish and uh, take them flash frozen or on ice and run them back to Japan and have something at least in their cargo hold uh, to sell. And when they did that, of course, now they became available on the market, this nice fresh tuna uh, that was brought in and the people developed a taste for it and it just went ballistic after that. So the price of tuna went up and up. In the early 70s when the fish were basically worthless, uh, we were fishing totally for sport. We were pretty much sticking to IGFA rules, International Game Fish Association, you know, which set specifics on line strength and leader material. And for example, you couldn't use a harpoon. It wouldn't be legal if you wanted to weigh it for a record or in a tournament. So we were fishing strictly uh, legal at that point in time, according to IGFA rules. And of course, fishing that way, you lost a lot of fish. Uh, when the fish became extremely valuable, well, that pretty much went out the window. And a whole fishery developed, commercial fishery, uh, to catch these fish and sell them to actually make money at it. All right? And so developed a commercial giant tuna fishing fleet up in Gloucester and up in the Northeast. So, uh, on to Wicked Tuna. So, what you're looking at here are people that are fulfilling two purposes. They're catching fish, trying to make money to support their, uh, their sport, their, uh, their boat, and the, their economy, and making money, and at the same time, being part of a reality TV show. So uh, whoever came up with the idea, I think, d hit it on the head. Uh, it's very exciting. Uh, it's moments of chaos with indeterminably long periods of nothing. A giant tuna fish is very difficult. Uh, you're basically dealing with one of the biggest fish in the world, right? a giant tuna which can weigh anywhere from typically 300 pounds, which is about minimum size to be considered a giant, up to the world record which was almost 1,500 pounds. 
So you're going to say, typically battling 500, 600 pound fish. Uh, they're very, very hard fighting, very tough. So it's a tremendous challenge to a fisherman uh, to catch one once you've hooked it. The other challenge is just getting a fish to bite. Uh, tuna fish are extremely uh, keen sensed uh, battlers. These fish have tremendous eyesight. Uh, they can see leader material. Uh, they can tell if something's just not right. And then if they do bite and you hook them, they're extremely powerful. The fish is built for speed and strength. When you look at it, it looks like a football. It's all muscle. Very, very strong. And so chances are, if you don't do everything exactly right, you're going to lose the fish or worse, someone could get hurt because you're dealing with a giant. So anyway, uh, having shot a lot of video with Tim Smith, Tim and I have done a lot of videos together. Uh, I know the difficulty in producing a good video. One of the toughest things about making a fishing video is catching fish. If you set out to make a fishing video and fishing is poor, well then it becomes a very difficult project. You have very little footage that you can use uh, to make your final product. I mean, Tim and I, we did a shoot up on the Hudson River for striped bass. Uh, everything was planned out, we had guides, we had all of this taking place, it was incredible. We did not catch one fish. So, you know, days worth of effort was just in a garbage can because you didn't catch fish. Uh, now, giant tuna fishing, it's not like, you know, catching snappers. Uh, sometimes you may sit there for a whole day, two days, even more, and not have a bite. Um, you know, sometimes the entire fleet strikes out. The body of fish moves off to the different grounds and where they caught them yesterday, they're not catching them today. And then it's no bites and you have no footage that's usable. So, you know, inherently these are the problems with producing a video. So, Wicked Tuna, I think it's a great idea to do this, but what happened was I think in the first two seasons fishing was not that good. So they had a lot of downtime in between, and uh, I think also a part of the show was reality TV, you need to have drama. So of course, there's all of the interactions between the different crews and all of the little arguments and battles they have, and then they bring in characters like Tyler, who's a real comedian, and a younger generation mocking the older guys, and generates uh, you know this interest and drama as a typical, you know, a reality show will. And that's continued on, and that kind of takes up in the dead spaces, maybe when there wasn't much action, and the poor editor who's trying to make something out of nothing, I mean, he's only got a couple of action sequences with a couple of fish hooked up, and maybe one of them is lost. What does the editor do? He has to take the reality drama stuff, put a bunch of that in there, and with a couple of clips of the actual fish being caught or hooked up and then fill it in the gap with you know the same scene shown over and over of that same rod tip popping up when the line breaks um, and the general public as not being you know familiar with all of the tactics and, and fishing at all uh, they just kind of gloss over that I don't think their mind catches something that is not really in sequence the way it should have been but if you're on the water a lot and you've done a lot of fishing you see things like when the fish is hooked up, they're in fairly rough water, and then when they lift the fish into the boat, it's flat calm. You know the fish was caught at a different, you know, on a different boat or at a different time or on a different day. Um, you know, I guess they didn't have enough footage so that the editor could take, find a similar situation with similar water background and show a fish being caught so it was more realistic. So they had to go with what they have. And I guess it was limited, and they do what they had to do. Uh, a couple of the other things that I cracked up about uh, was, I think when that whole thing happened with TJ and um, dot com about giving them the numbers, and then he didn't give the number, told me he didn't catch fish there, and then TJ went someplace else and didn't catch, and uh, dot com went back and caught fish, all of this. They're given numbers over the radio, the VHF, and these days that's passe. I mean, anyone who's on the water and is fishing for money and uh, doesn't want people to know what's going on or where the fish are uses a satellite phone. 
uh, a couple of shots. In fact, this last week's show, you see the helm on Dave's boat, and you see the satellite phone hooked up on the side. Uh, that's how most of these captains communicate when they want to keep things private. But for the sake of reality show, it's on the air, everybody's hearing it, and uh, it just makes it, you know, more drama. Uh, let's see, other critiques I have about it. One of the big ones was that they just kept showing that same broken line and it's the same rod. You can see the windings, the wrapping on it. It's the same color, it's the same rod, it's the same, same shot of a lost fish probably five or six times uh, during the second season. Uh, and then the shots with the water where the conditions just don't match at all. Uh, or they show you they're all fighting a fish and they take a shot from be above and the boat's still tied off to the anchor line. Uh, so, you know, I think the editing could have been a little bit better, but to give them the benefit of the doubt, I just think there wasn't as much action in season one and two. Not as many fish caught, so they had to go more with the drama and, uh, you know, with fill-in scenes that didn't quite match up. Now, the first two shows in season three, uh, I think there was a real good bite this year in 2015 and there was a lot of fishing action uh, there was a double hookup which is very unusual uh, and so they didn't have to do as much fill in and they had good footage this you know sequentially it went right and everything kind of matched so I think uh, there's a good bite on this year and I think the show is better because of that good action makes it more realistic and of course they still have the drama thing going which is good too. And I'm glad to see Dave and TJ made up. But uh, anyway, just my take on it. I think it's a great show. I look forward to seeing it every week. So, you know, that's it. You have any comments, you go to the website. Uh, you can contact us. You can email me or Tim. And uh, of course, we want you to like us on YouTube and subscribe to us if you can. So, that's it for this week. We'll try and keep more information coming to you over the winter here. And uh, we'll kind of wrap it up and say we'll see you soon.